I'm interviewing Hank Kreinhoff from Holland, a esteemed coach and uh, scientist and uh, a man who has brought a high degree of science to the art of coaching, uh, in particular the speed and power uh, training or events. Uh, Hank is in Sydney and uh, I feel very honoured to uh, be given this time with you, Hank, and I hope I don't, uh, uh, don't miss too many important questions. Uh, this is for the uh, Athletics New South Wales uh, website. So welcome to Australia, Hank, and uh, yeah, I hope Thank you're you. enjoying your Happy time. Happy to be here, yeah. Yep. So, so Hank, um, can you just talk to us possibly about uh, how you uh, assess an athlete uh, and possibly even uh, simplistically, I mean, yes, mm -hmm. the results... Deter will indicate closely whether an athlete should be a one, two, or four runner. Do you go purely mm -hmm. by results, or do you do you do some some other testing uh, with your athletes? Yeah, it's a it's an easy question, and uh, the answer is a little bit more complex than that. Because in the end, it will show in competition. If you're a hundred meter runner, then your best event will be the hundred meter. The easiest thing to do is to look at how close you are to the world record. So if the world record we consider to be 100%, and if at uh, 100 meters you're at 95%, the 200 meters you're at 98%, and you're very close to the world record, and uh, let me say 99%, then the 400 meter might be your event. So that's a very easy way to uh, calculate which is your best event, even at a young age. You will be at 95% or 98% of the world record, but even if you're 80% or 85%, it will still give you an answer right there. And the results in competition will speak for them for themselves. If uh, uh, you win all the 100 meters and uh, all the 400 meters, even at the national level, you become dead last and the 100 meter might be your event. You can also look at the body structure. You never see a very heavy muscular bodybuilding type uh, 400 meter runner, while you might see a very heavy muscular 100 meter runner. So there's many ways to find out the suitability of an athlete for a specific event. I can all use, use all kinds of uh, scientific testing, but I found there's not too much help in there. Can you uh, talk to us a little bit about uh, the value of doing muscle biopsy as it, mm. as it affects uh, how you coach an athlete in terms of uh, whether you give them more speed power work or maybe a bit more endurance work or maybe more volume or maybe greater density? Mm. And that's in, in influenced by what you, your results in uh, bi muscle biopsy? Yeah, the muscle biopsy will tell you everybody having all muscles a mixture of fast and slow fibers. The fast fibers are perfectly suited for generating power, generating velocity. The flip side is they're not very good in endurance because they use a lot of fuel. Consider the fast twitch athlete with the dominant fast twitch fibers. Consider it to be a Ferrari. It's a fast car with a big engine, but it consumes a lot of fuel. It needs to go to the petrol station every couple of, well, almost like minutes because it's consuming so much uh, fuel. It has to top up all the time. The slow fiber is more, with dominant slow fibers, it means more than 50% slow fibers in the relevant muscles, not in your cheek muscles, but in your leg muscles, of course. We, legs are doing all the work when you're an athlete or when you're a runner. Um, they do very well in uh, endurance work or aerobic type work. They don't generate that much speed, they don't generate much power, but they're great in endurance and they don't fatigue that easily. Now, take a muscle biopsy, you get a very detailed uh, uh, view on the percentage of muscle fiber. You 80 fast, 20 slow, then you must be a very good sprinter and probably a 60 meter runner or 100 meter runner. Or you have a 80 slow and 20 fast, then you might be very good in the 10K or the marathon. But most people have somewhere around 50 50. The bulk of the people that you meet, you or your parents or your coach, might have 50 50. And that's perfect for 4 and 8 in the middle running. So, <clears throat> because you need to be fast and you also need to maintain that speed for a longer period of time. So, it's not to the extremes, uh, I must say. And the muscle biopsy helps us to. Um, it's like you buy a new car, you look at the tires, you look at the color, you look how many seats. Uh, but you also want to look at, at, at the engine of the car, the motor of the car. If you have a, a, a big car motor, if you want to have a very flashy car and, and, uh, and show off a little bit, and you take a, a car with a big engine, which accelerates very fast, from 0 to 100 kilometers an hour in 3 seconds, 
only the EU should be able to pay the price of the petrol. So every advantage comes with, comes with a disadvantage as, as well. Now, if you have uh, fast fibers, basically you're, you're more like a cheetah. You're very fast, but in the end, when you got your prey, you got tired. You can't even eat it at, at, at that place or uh, drag it anywhere else because you're just too tired. So compare sprinters, fast switch fibers to cheetahs. Where the, the people with more better endurance, more slow twitch fibers, are more like, uh, well, horses. They can maintain their speed for a longer period of time, hours and hours uh, back to back, or like dogs, they can chase their prey for many, many hours, and they rely on endurance. So this helps us uh, to, uh, to see what the strength or the weakness of the athlete are, and of course, which training. Now, it doesn't make sense to teach, uh, I'll give this kind of simple example, it doesn't make sense to teach a cow to jump. It doesn't make sense, being in Australia, to teach a kangaroo to swim, because it's just not built for it, it's just not designed for it. So if you have a lot of slow twitch fibers and still want to beat Usain Bolt, you're doomed to fail. It's like trying to take a Volkswagen Beetle and try to compete in a Formula One race. And the other way around. If you have a Ferrari race car, it's not uh, very good in driving in the desert on, uh, through, uh, through the sand. So you do whatever uh, comes close to your design, that's uh, very important. And many times you see things go wrong. Uh, people are really sprinters and they're trained like middle distance runners. So middle distance runners and trained like sprinters. And what you see is very little result, <clears throat> no progress in the end. And you also see risk of injuries. And that's the most important to me because once again, the Volkswagen Beetle in the Formula One race, before the first lap, it will be, uh, it will be uh, uh, you crash the car already. It's just not suited for that. So that's the importance of muscle fibers. A question that you've had two of the, the great female sprint, sprinters of, of, uh, of, of recent decades. Uh, you worked with Merlene Otty, and I think you contributed to her breaking through from 20 bronze medals to her first gold medal <laughs> yeah. in the World Championships in the 200 metres, and you also had Nelly Fier Kuman who won, uh, broke a world record for indoor, uh, for 60 metres mm -hmm. and uh, won a world indoor title and maybe a couple of European, I think. Um, very different body structure. Yeah. Um, how was the, di how did you train them differently? Could you possibly give us a little example? Yeah, Nelly had more fast fibres, which is great because she was good in start and acceleration, but she suffered a little bit in the last part of the race. So she had a very good 60 metres, but a 100 metre wasn't at that level and the 200 meters was kind of a, a, a torture to her it was a long 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 distance well Malin could run a good 60 a decent 60 not as fast as Nelly her start and acceleration weren't fast enough to be real fast then the 100 meter was uh, really good the 200 meters is really good and uh, once in a while when we really pushed her she could run a 400 meters so how did it help her um, I tend to coach athletes in their strength, so Nelly's strength was a uh, start and acceleration. When I was a young coach, uh, and kind of naive, I believed that increasing her endurance was helped by making Nelly run 150s and 200s and 250s longer runs with low intensity. And um, to increase the speed endurance from, 40, from 60 to 100 meters. And yes, absolutely, it worked because she got one tenth of a second faster in the last 40 meters. The problem was, by doing that kind of work, she lost two tenths of a second in the first 60 meters. So in the end, uh, she ended up being slower instead of being faster, doing the long work, because she was just not suited to do that kind of long work. It was against her real natural design. Yeah. And uh, with, with Merlene, mm -hmm. uh, did you do anything specifically for her that enabled her to come through so well? Well, um, she wasn't particularly well designed for 60 meter, but even that, she was way beyond even her normal potential just because she never learned to start properly and to accelerate properly. It's more a technical thing and a mental thing. So in the end, um, she always let people go out of the box first and then chase them. Uh, okay. Like so the rabbits. And so, well, kick the habit, be the rabbit instead of let other people be rabbits and then you catch up with them halfway the race and then you try to beat them because then you're too late. 
So 100 meter was decent, but she lost too much time in the first 60 meters. Look at your same belt. What makes him great that with his height, with this tall guy, is already there, is already in front after 40 to 50 meters. And that's what makes him great. The last part of the race is brilliant. I've never seen it better. But the, 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 his exception is that he's very good in the first 50, 60 meters as well. He can accelerate like crazy. So that makes him an exceptional athlete. And Malin was at the same potential, but she just stayed behind the first 60 meters while she could do better. So that's why I put a lot of time and effort in improving the first 60 meters, learning to start and accelerate. She would never be as good as Nelly, but she shouldn't lose that much time in the first 60 meters uh, anyhow. You referred to uh, Merlin Otti uh, uh, adjusting um, her start technique or mechanics. Uh, <laughs> can you talk to us about uh, what you th- your, your philosophy or your thoughts on, on tampering with an athlete's mechanics, a sprinter's mechanics particularly? All right, very simple. If it ain't broken, don't try to fix it. The athletes have a natural style. Why do people run, you see five athletes run in five different, uh, maybe not techniques because techniques are pretty but the diff- five different styles. The style is interpretation of technique based on your anatomy, your leverage, your height, your muscle fiber composition, so it's based on many factors. Now you can try to change it, but the question is, it will take time to change it, and are we changing it to the right direction? Many times I see athletes you try to change things that cannot be changed. Some things cannot be changed because you are built this way. Would you, have tried, would you have tried to change Chitty Emo's style? You know <laughs> I mean? That's a good one. That's a good one. I don't think so. I don't think so. Really? Yeah. He was yeah. arms everywhere. Uh, everywhere. Feet yeah. everywhere. Yeah, absolutely. But he absolutely. could run uh, 10 flat, eh? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, don't forget... But it's also my uh, my uh, colleagues. It wouldn't show respect to my colleagues to say, well, you know, they're all idiots. Um, they didn't try. Probably not for lack of trying. Look at Michael Johnson. How many times I heard athletes or coaches say, oh, I wish I could coach Michael Johnson because look how off he's running. He's sitting, he's leaning backwards, he's running straight up instead of leaning forwards a little bit. You think his coach is stupid that he didn't try to change his thing? He did, but probably not for the best. The things got worse. So no one ever estimates your colleagues saying that things could be better. Probably they tried and they figured out, and sometimes uh, after a long time, and sometimes after a period of, uh, of uh, disappointment, that you cannot change everything. That's it. Recovery ultimately determines the quality of, of uh, future sessions. And quality mm. determines pretty much how far you go in your career, how high you get. Yeah. Um, how do you monitor recovery? How do you decide when an athlete is ready to, to, to go uh, quickly again? There's two ways. There's, uh, the way I always did it, and most coaches uh, still do, fortunately. It's the old-fashioned way by observing, looking at your athlete, looking how they move, looking how they talk, look at how tired they are, if they're slouching, if they're just dragging their feet to the track, or they're bubbling and sparkling and full of energy, so you can see if they recovered or not. Uh, by listening to them, by questioning them, by taking, uh, their, looking at the diaries, if they're you know, all of a sudden in, in a couple of days they don't, cannot follow the program anymore. It could be your program, it could be they're not recovered from the, from the workouts before. Looking at the diary, you could see probably a pattern there. Maybe the lack of sleep, maybe they feel sore, maybe they feel tired. And then it's time to change something. That's probably uh, still a very good way, but for me it wasn't enough. I wanted to find out not only that it works or if it works, but how it works. So I got equipment, pretty expensive equipment I must say, in order to look inside the body what's happening, which physiological system we're tired. So fatigue is not an overall phenomenon. It's not, it's not pain. Coach, I have pain. First question you ask, where do you have pain? In your head or in your toes or in your Achilles tendon? Now you're tired. Now the question should be, what is tired? Are you tired in the brain, central nervous fatigue? Are you tired in the muscles? Are you tired, is your hormone uh, system is it depleted? Uh, is it your autonomic nervous system? You don't know, and the athlete doesn't know, but he never asked this question, so what is tired? So also there's a, you have to look at the distinction of different kinds of fatigue. So the most important ones are muscle fatigue, you run out of fuel, you must run out of fuel, mainly glycogen. Uh, central nervous fatigue, too many things on your mind, your brain is tired from the, from the firing to the muscles. 
autonomous service, nervous system for that's a complex one. Eh? That just you, you, you squeeze out so much adrenaline that there's no adrenaline left. Or hormonal fatigue, you squeeze out so much stress hormone or cortisol that the adrenals are depleted. So there's four important uh, factors in, uh, in uh, fatigue. And without measuring, you don't know. So you just are just stumbling in the dark and hoping that the kind of fatigue you uh, <coughs> you found is the right one. So it's taking, you're doing interventions, doing therapies without a proper diagnosis. And sometimes it works and sometimes it just doesn't. Okay. Uh, might take one little break there. <laughs> this is part two with Henk Krynoff in 2014. Henk, can you give us your thoughts on, on um, Mechanics, the mechanics of sprinting. I mean, we talk. Some coaches talk a lot about front side mechanics. Some talk a lot about rear side mechanics. Uh, as far as I can see, uh, the only thing that all sprinters seem to have in common, all great sprinters, seem to be uh, the the foot of the of the swing leg crosses the uh, stance leg at or above the knee. <laughs> well, that's a very generic trend, and you're absolutely right about it. Um, number one, technique is always, mechanics always uh, limit, limited by anatomy. So you can't expect somebody like Usain Bolt having the same setup from the blocks like somebody who is uh, only uh, 5 foot 10. So that's, that's, uh, that's one. The fiber type will also uh, be limiting or allowing for a certain uh, technique to be uh, done. Uh, my very simple position is again, if it ain't broken, don't try to fix it. As many people with different techniques, uh, the last 2,000 years, we didn't see anything in technique. Now, the last 10 years, probably because of marketing or because it's interesting or to whatever, we see different techniques. Put in. The pose technique by Nikolai Romanov, the, the Bosch technique, or the Rolf Mann and Lawrence Seagrave, frontside mechanics, and uh, I think it's a simplification of, the, of reality. Um, I think technique didn't change if you look at the Greek vases of 2,000 years ago. You see the position of the sprinters is pretty much like you see our best sprinter now, Usain Bolt running. There's not too much changes because basically the human being didn't change. It's a natural movement that we're all able to do. If you take the arm, one arm giant swing on the, on, the, on the gymnastics bar, that might be something you might train for years. It's kind of unnatural. But everybody is a sprinter to start with. Everybody can sprint. Hank, uh, how important is uh, is therapy in terms of you know things like chiropractics, massage, physiotherapy uh, in uh, the day to day preparation uh, of of a sprinter? Well, I was in the unfortunate position not be able to to aff be able to afford those other things. I was not able to have a massage therapist, a physical therapist, a chiropractor. If you have them and they know what they're doing. Use them by all means, there's no problem, but I don't see that I find it, 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 it might not be necessary. The most important thing for changes in the athlete's body is, uh, is the training itself. If your training is right and you need less therapy, then because then it becomes such a subtle, fragile system that you need to push certain buttons all the time and it, it, it becomes an unmanageable complex of, uh, of uh, factors that you try to do there. I know that some of my colleagues use a lot between therapy, but therapy means there's something wrong. Uh, once again, here the same thing, if it's broken down, try to fix it. I've seen some strange things uh, with massage. <laughs> and uh, I've seen some strange things with, with uh, massage, and athletes got worse uh, by massaging. Also, you become dependent on that. So then one day you panic because your chiropractor didn't do your stuff or your massage treatment give you a massage you panic because you get dependent on a placebo of, uh, of treatment all the time but that's my personal take on this hmm. um, variety is, is, is very important uh, stimulation is important without stimulation there can be no, no need for adaptation yeah. to a higher level yeah. can you possibly give us some examples of maybe of how you stimulated, uh, you know, any 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 good sprinter to, to uh, suddenly make some breakthroughs. <clears throat> well, perhaps not suddenly, but well, yeah, that's, that's the interesting thing. That suddenly, 
Um, like Dan Pfeff used to say, I'm from the school of hard knocks. I'm from the same school. I'm a student of the University of Rude Awakenings. I realize that there's no magic exercise. I realize there's no magic potion. I realize there's no magic approach at all. It's all pretty rational. Sometimes you see a breakthrough, but it might be the result of what happened in the years before. All of a sudden it pops up because one thing we have is delayed effect of training. So sometimes you're uh, working hard for two years without any progress and all of a sudden the athlete is making progress and you ask yourself, where does it come from all of a sudden? It might be a change that you even didn't even notice. It might be a technical change and all of a sudden we say uh, it starts to dawn on the athlete. It could be from one day to another, but they see the light somehow in a technical sense. They, they have what sprinting is all about. So if you see a sudden tremendous improvement in athletes, ask yourself, where does it come from? It puzzles me like anyone else. And I hardly see it because, uh, well, if you see it, it's kind of suspect nowadays also. If, you, if people improve uh, too much within one year, you see the body structure change, and mm, okay. But even that, in, even in your own athletes, you're just puzzled by the, uh, what did I do to deserve this as a coach? <laughs> yeah. hey, what are your thoughts on uh, strength training for, for sprinters? Do you, what type of strength training would you advocate? I would advocate a, a mixture between maximum strength training and power training. Maximum strength training is looking for high intensity training, more than 90% of your RM, low amount of repetition, somewhere between let's say two and five repetitions, and just the fact of getting stronger. Not necessarily get more muscle because you have to drag the muscle over the track. So I'm not looking for hypertrophy, but we're looking for recruitment. We did do this in the last couple of years, but then we also found that power training is moving a lower weight, somewhere between 30 and 60 percent of your 1RM, with some more repetitions, at a, but at a much higher velocity, maximum velocity, was uh, much more advantageous. Number one, you don't lift at heavy weight, so there's less risk for back problems or knee problems. Number two, you increase power, because if the weight gets heavier, and it gets heavier, you also get slower. Now, by in power, you focus on moving that weight, if it's 30% of your 1RM or 60%, it doesn't matter, with the highest possible velocity, and that's what you want in competition well. You want to own body weight with the highest possible velocity over the track. But doesn't Olympic weightlifting uh, <coughs> give you both, both worlds? Yeah, yeah, Olympic weightlifting gives you both, give you strength and give you power. As a matter of fact, it's a power event. The only thing is that Olympic lifting has a strong um, technical component. And especially, it takes years and years before a weightlifter is able to lift a weight very well. It comes very, within one second, you're doing a lot of, well, very technical, coordinated uh, uh, movements. So it might take years to develop. And if you don't develop it well, people might have a wrong technique and, uh, and again, increases the risk of injury. This is my problem. And when you have old athletes, some athletes you get when they're 28 years old or even 30 years old, they never learn it. You're t basically too late. And then the risk of doing Olympic lift is larger than the benefit you have with it. And I prefer power training because power training, you can use any equipment. You can do squats, you can do uh, uh, leg presses on power, you can bench press on power, you can do any exercises with a high velocity. Then you get, still get the same effect without the risk of injuries because of much simpler movements as a matter of fact. And it doesn't, doesn't tax the central nervous system quite in the way that uh, Olympic lifting lift does. It, it does. It certainly does, but, but uh, a 100 meter runner and, a, and somebody who's also training the Olympic lifts, yeah. like Power Clean or Snatch, yeah. uh, Clean and Jerk, yeah. they are recruiting from the same resource, Yeah. same, yeah. same neural resource, so there's a higher chance of CNS fatigue. Uh, yeah, well, basically I measured everything, of course, with EEG and EMG. And um, you'll be surprised how much uh, difference there is between uh, doing a, a one repetition maximum, maximum, or doing ten squats with uh, or eight squats with uh, a lower weight at maximum speed. You will see what happens in the brain. It's amazing because your perception will be that it's much uh, more intense and much more fatiguing to do one repetition maximum. But then again, you can only repeat it once. Yeah, but if you're doing block starts on the same day, yeah. uh, you, it's like doing uh, 
max explosiveness without the load, and the un- <coughs> you're still charging up the nervous system. Yeah. And there's a thin line between um, training the nervous system, so you're charging it or stimulating it or toning up the nervous system and depleting the nervous system. There's a very thin line there. I mean, there's a thin line between uh, a warming up or a recovery training and training. So your recovery training might be a training stimulus for me because you're much better trained than I am. So as long as you don't know if you're stimulating the system or that means using the system with a positive effect or you're stimulating the system with uh, depletion, with fatigue, there's a thin line and you don't know where that line is without measuring. That's true. Can I, uh, in Here's closing... A, let, me, let me interrupt you a little bit. Please do. There's a, there's a, for instance, what we used to do in former days was a so-called complex training from Verkhoshansky, which means first we do weights, then we do bounding, and then we go to the starting blocks and do starts. Does it work? Yes and no. You know where it depends on? On the fiber type. If you're fast with fibers, and first you do weights, and then you do bounding. By the time you go to the blocks, you're depleted already. You're fast with fibers. It doesn't work. People hang. I can't start anymore. I gave all my energy in the squats and in the bounding, in the jumping. So my legs feel heavy. If you're slow fibers, you can't recruit that much of uh, slow fibers. You do the weights, you feel great. You feel the jump, you feel even feel better. And then you go to the blocks and you still feel good. So they can repeat it because they're slow twitch fibers. So does it work, yes or no? It depends on the fiber type in this, in this uh, case. And the same uh, applies to, uh, to uh, doing any strength exercise. For somebody, it might be good to do, and for somebody, it might be depleting. So the same exercise might have a different effect a couple of minutes later when you're in the blocks. It depends if you stimulate the brain and deplete it and make it tired, or you stimulate the brain and get, wow, I feel really powerful now. It depends. Uh, perhaps in closing, I would ask your advice to any uh, young coach coming through. Uh, how do they educate themselves? How do they become a great coach? <laughs> yeah. um, there's a couple of things which are so obvious that it's, it, it, it's almost hard. Uh, that, that I, I, I don't come up with any uh, innovative here. Number one, study as much as you can from, from science from experience of your colleagues. Don't be afraid to exchange uh, your opinion and ask what you call stupid questions. Don't be afraid of that. I asked more stupid questions than anybody could answer. Um, be patient, be patient. Most coaches are looking for the long term and things that might turn out good for the long term might be turn out bad for the, for, sorry, good for the short term might be turn out bad for the long term. So think in the long term. Now it's against the, the soul of times because everybody wants Next week we want to be world champion, next week we want to be national champion. We only look at the short term and the measures we take for the short term might turn out badly for the long term, like increase of uh, training. If you want to remember one thing from my, uh, from my heritage, it's kind of this sentence. Train as much as necessary, not as much as possible. How simple it, it looks, how simple it sounds, it's probably the most complicated thing to do. But for me it was the most useful uh, lesson that I learned. Henk Kronoff, thank you very much. Okay. Mike, thank you, thank you very much for this opportunity to uh, speak. I'm sure you'll influence many coaches in Australia okay. and from around the world. Okay. <laughs>